I wrote a book last year, and uh, in this book, uh, just by chance, uh, I have a quote uh, from, from Minister Horne's uh, predecessor, who's a former Norwegian minister of children and family, uh, Valgard Haugland. And this is what he had to say a number of years ago about Norway's philosophy about family and paid leave. Uh, so he says, quote, we have decided that the raising of a child is real work. Isn't that striking? So simple. Um, is real work and that this work produces value for the whole society. Not exactly earth shattering, but not generally stated uh, by government officials. So he goes on to say, it is only fair then that, quote, that the society as a whole should pay for this valuable service. So raising a child is real work. It is work that is valuable for society. And if it is valuable for society, then society should pay for it, uh, at least uh, in, in terms of supporting the people who do it. So with that sort of basic proposition, that I think underpins the conversation about paid leave. And I will say paid family leave for children, for parents, meaning par children who are taking care of their own parents, for any ill or disabled family member, anyone who needs care. That care, uh, beyond children, uh, provides value uh, for society, and we should support it. And oh, pretty much alone, uh, the United States, as we know, has no maternity leave. We're with Papua New Guinea and a few other countries in that regard, no paternity leave, and no paid family leave at the federal level at all. Uh, we do have unpaid family leave, the Family and Medical Leave Act, uh, but of course that is only for people who are in businesses uh, who hire more than 50 people, uh, and there are other restrictions. So effective, and that's unpaid, right? You, you you keep your job, but you don't you don't actually get paid. So when I travel in other countries, people look at me and say, "What does your government expect?" You know, the, the we parents just sort of like have a baby and go back to work, the, you know, the next week. Uh, th that how on earth can you possibly assume your children are going to be cared for? And I don't have a good answer. Uh, so this, uh, we have uh, people in the audience today who are fighting uh, for paid leave. It is starting to happen at the state level. New Jersey has paid leave, Rhode Island, California, uh, and at the city level. Uh, Washington, D.C. is passing paid leave right now. Uh, so we're getting there in our sort of laboratories of democracy way, but we have a long way to go. So that with those reflections, uh, I want to start uh, by welcoming uh, the... Uh, our star attraction of the evening, uh, Her Excellency uh, Solve Horney, uh, who is the, I, I absolutely love your title. I have to say, this says so much. Uh, she, she, Minister Horney is the Minister of Children, Equality, and Social Inclusion for the Kingdom of Norway. I just love the idea, children, equality, and social inclusion. <laughs> Um, she has been uh, a member of Prime Minister uh, Erna Solberg's cabinet uh, since 2013. Uh, she has served uh, in elected office since 1995 uh, and was elected to the Norwegian Parliament in 2005 as a member of the Progress Party, and she's been re-elected for two consecutive terms. Uh, so, you know, in Norway, being a minister also means being an elected politician, unlike uh, in our system. Of course, it depends. Uh, and in uh, Norway, Norway, Minister Horney has championed a whole range of issues related to work, life, and family, uh, paternity leave policies, uh, a cash benefit uh, that allows parents uh, and children to stay home together for longer when the child is an infant. Uh, and I particularly like this. This is maybe the only place the United States is ahead of Norway uh, that I can think of, uh, which is to adopt our custom of date night uh, once a week so that parents can actually uh, find time, in her words, to be lovers again. So I'm very supportive of that as well, although I can't tell you when the last time my husband and I had a date night. Uh, so uh, Minister Horney is going to start with some remarks, uh, and then we will turn uh, to our panel. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Anne-Marie, for the kind introduction. And I almost forgot about the date night. 
<laughs> and I remember I have been a minister for maybe two or three months, uh, and uh, the, then the, the media was talking about date night because I had a, a conversation with some uh, the family counseling services, and they called me from the, the Guardian, and I think it was the New York Times, and, sp and asked me, where did you get the idea from? Was it the Obama? <laughs> and I didn't know. <laughs> But okay, that's, um, thank you so much for, for inviting, um, once again, inviting me to New America's debate on gender equality. And let me just say to you that this debate is also on high on the political agenda also in Norway, um, the parental leave. And also gender equality is a matter of equal opportunities. That's for both women and men to have the possibility of a fulfilling working life and at the same time be able to have a family life. And how can we balance this in the best way for both families and society? And this is a subject that keeps engaging because it concerns us, all of us. And tonight, I will uh, address how Norway has designed a family-friendly labor market policy for both men and women, and the children, and also our economy. Norway is often scored as one of the three most gender equal countries in the world on UN and other statistics. Gender equality has been a political goal since the early 1980s for all Norwegian governments, also for the present one. Last year, I present, uh, presented a white paper to Parliament on gender equality. Equal, equality in practice, equal opportunities for women and men. This is a political document where the government lines up future policy in five crucial areas, including workforce participation. This is a topic I will touch upon tonight. But I also like to mention that I will also about to present a white paper on family policies. Let me share with you some experience from Norway. But high female participation in the formal pay workforce has a decisive effect on a country's economic performance, as the Norwegian experience shows. Any country's main asset is its workforce. In Norway, even with our oil welfare, is no expectation. In the last 50 years, there has been tremendous change in women's participation in pay work in Norway, more than in other, uh, most other OECD countries. Labor market participation and pay work have been a key to economic independence for women. It has given women the possibility to develop and use their professional skills. Since the beginning of the 1970s, the labor participation rate has risen from 44% to 76% for women. At the same time, Norwegian women have had one of the highest fertility rates in Europe. In addition, to the benefit of all Norwegians today, eight out of 10 mothers with small children are working. So how is this possible? First, the increase in female employment in Norway took place at a time when there was a rise in demand for labor, alongside a remarkable boost in women taking higher education. Secondly, we have invested in reaching full coverage of kindergartens at the subsidized price. In Norway today, nine out of 10 children aged one to five years attend kindergartens. Kindergartens for all children of one year of age and older was made a statutory right in 2008. Affordable and high quality kindergartens make it possible for both women and men to combine work and family life. Third, 
Norway has a gener generous parental, parental benefit schemes and other schemes, giving fathers and mothers a unique opportunity to combine work life and family life. The parental benefit schemes entitles parents to pay leave at, of absence in 49 weeks with 100% pay or 59 weeks with 80% paid. In order, I see you laughing. <laughs> yeah. In, like yeah, yeah, yes, yes. But it's in Norway, so it's real. In order to encourage father also to be involved in care for their children, a father's quota of four weeks was established in 1993. Today, the quota is 10 weeks, and we know the quota has had a positive impact on the father's use of parental leave. Before the father's quota was introduced, only two or three percent of fathers took parental leave. When I, ha when I had my first child in 1990, my husband had one day of parental leave. Today, we estimate that about 90% of fathers who have the right to this quota make use of it. In that sense, we have experienced a distinct change in man's attitudes. As a positive result, today it is a common seeing, it's coming seeing fathers with their baby strollers as mothers, or men bringing and picking up their kids in kindergarten. Yet yeah, even my fellow minister, the Minister of Education, had parental leave when he recently had his first child. For self-employed men and women, it can still be difficult to make full use of their parental leave. It is also important that each family must be ensured flexibility and freedom to choose the solution that best suits them. We must also acknowledge that children and families are different and have different ways to solving their lives and their needs. Today, the quota in is, is 10 weeks each for both mothers and fathers. The rest of the total of 49 weeks can be shared as the family find best. The main object of the parental leave is to give children the best start in life. It is a flexible scheme, a scheme that, that which the parents can make use of until the child turns three. It is a main goal that both mothers and fathers can combine family and work life. That's why workers are entitled to work flexible and shorter hours and take pay leave if their child is ill. I would, like, I would also like to challenge the employees to encourage male workers to make use of their rights to parental leave. I want to stress that these quite generous schemes first and foremost benefit the child. The child gets to have one of the parents at home with pay leave the first year. In addition, the father's quota ensures that both parents participate actively at an early stage of the child's life. This is a valuable investment for the future for both the children and parents. It is good for the ch child to have two caregiving and engaged parents instead of one. It is good for the adults as both of them can experience professional fulfillment and at the same time have a caring and loving relationship to their child. Women's active participation in the workforce is the basis, a basis of our welfare state. Our welfare schemes may seem costly, I see that, but they simply ensure a sustainable future. As said, labor force participation in Norway is among the highest in the OECD for men, especially for women. One next step for Norway will be to find ways to encourage women to move from part-time to full-time work. With family provisions and childcare already in place, we believe that this is within reach. 
Each country must make their own way. And I hope that the experience we have made in Norway can inspire others to new solutions. What I do believe is that talents and abilities are equally divided between women and men all over the world. And giving girls and women, women the same access to education, jobs, and leading positions as men, we make use of all, soci all society's talents and resources. And giving men the opportunity to be good fathers, the whole family will benefit, and we will give our children the best starting point in life. And that's our common goal, isn't it? Thank you. Can we just please applaud one more time for Mr. Horn? <laughs> And for the government of Norway for leading the way. We are going to now bring up a panel to have a conversation about um, very different perspectives on how this, this problem and possible solutions affects us here at home, in business, uh, in public policy, and personally as parents. My name is Heather McGee. I'm the president of Demos. Demos is a public policy organization Headquartered here in New York, just a couple of blocks away, we're very, very glad to be partnering with New America uh, on this event and very glad to have you, Anne Marie, as always, uh, leading the way in these conversations. Demos's mission is to create an America where we all have an equal say in our democracy and an equal chance in our economy. And that is why we have taken on the issue of paid family leave as a research issue. We have a set of reports that are actually here uh, on the table as you leave called Lagging on Leave, which um, is hot off the presses, uh, that really finds an incredible situation here in New York, which is that nine out of 10 workers in New York State have no paid leave from their employers. Nine out of 10. That's almost six and a half million workers. The reason why we thought it was important to lift up that uh, new number is that there is a fight going on right here, right now at this very moment. Mayor Bill de Blasio led the way with as much authority as he could do to offer uh, paid leave for municipal workers, 100% of pay. Um, that happened just a couple of months ago, and we have late breaking news that Governor Cuomo's proposal for a paid leave program um, that would be paid for by a payroll tax like they have in California, Rhode Island, and New Jersey uh, has made it into both his budget and potentially the Republican budget as well. I know there are some people in the audience who are heavily engaged in that fight, and so I hope in the, in the Q&A we'll be able to learn how we can lend our voices. We have an incredible set of three leaders right now, each in their own way, who are going to engage in this panel conversation. But just before I invite them each to come up, I want to say that for us at Demos, this question of how we value our people which is really, I think, the beautiful way that uh, Minister Horn really brought it home for us, is paramount. Demos means the people of a nation, and it's the root word of democracy. And I often laugh when we often, as progressives at Demos, compare our social and economic policies to those of countries like Norway and Denmark and Sweden, and find ourselves very much lagging. We have to grapple with something very different in the United States, which is a multiracial, multi-origin, multi-ethnic demos that is growing only more so by the day. And that fundamental question of do we think that our greatest asset as a country is our workforce, is our people, are our families, is one that we are contesting every single day.
And so when we look at public policy issues like paid family leave, like universal child care, like debt-free college, like high minimum wages and workers' rights protections across the board, we're talking about economic policy. But we're also talking about the fundamental notion of our social contract, which is at all times what we are deeply debating. And I think our presidential race right now and the incredible heat, anger, fear, and division that we are seeing being, uh, being sewn from the podium of someone from the highest office really calls that to the fore. So we're going to have a really beautiful, I think, conversation this evening about children, about families, about work, about public policy, and also about our future and who we are to one another. So I'd like to invite the panel up, please, without further ado. So I am joined here by three really remarkable people who, is each, who are each going to give um, a pretty unique perspective on the topic this evening. Um, we have Renee Wilson-Simmons, who is the director of the incredible National Center for Children and Poverty. If you have not uh, engaged with NCCP's work, you are missing out. I encourage you all to follow her on Twitter, uh, to go to their website for some of the most important research that is being done on these issues in America. We're also joined by Tom Alm, who's the Deputy Chief Auditor of DNB Bank ASA, which is a Norwegian-based bank, who's going to talk a little bit about his experience with uh, Norway's uh, parental leave policy. And then finally, here to my right, is Amber Skora, who is a parental leave advocate here in New York City. Um, and this is her first panel, where she'll be speaking about these issues. So we'll be uh, very encouraging and welcoming to her as she tells her story and we talk about the context here at home. So the first question I had was for you, Renee. Um, you have been working on these issues for some time. You are able to bring uh, a really a national sort of synthesis to the conversation right now. And so I'm just wondering if you can tell us what is the situation here in the US right now? What, what do you think is the case for paid parental leave? And, and why don't we have it? So. Those are all excellent questions. And I don't know if I can answer them succinctly, but I, I will say this, because we have a very specific perspective because we're the National Center for Children in Poverty. So we're really focused on the need to address paid family leave for that specific population. And it's great to hear uh, what's happening in New York and DC, because there are the District of Columbia and 19 other states introduce some type of paid family leave legislation in 2015 or this year, focusing on it, hoping that it happens. And some of them have already uh, sort of introduced it and will be reintroducing it because it's just not its just not happening. So from our perspective as, uh, as, as an organization that focuses on children in poverty, I, I think there are a couple of things we need to keep in mind. And one is that, 15% uh, of our population, that's 47 million people, are living at or below the poverty line. And there are 74 million children in the US, and 22% of them are living in poverty. So you think about that for a minute. The youngest, the most vulnerable to risk to their health and development, and the poorest. And because we know that children do better when families do better, the question becomes, how do we support parents to support their children? And again, from the perspective of, of families in poverty, I think, unfortunately, uh, there are, uh, continually negative perspectives about parents in poverty. It's why do you have so many children? That they're sort of reproductively prodigious or they're uh, uh, financially inept and they're in the situation they're in because they haven't made good decisions. And so it's not our responsibility as US to take care of those families, it's their responsibility. And I think those are uh, what we know about the importance of supporting families and children for the future of our nation tells us that we just have the wrong perspective. Thank you, Renee. Um, 
this question of who receives paid leave is one where you really see inequality um, come to the fore. Um, nationwide, the most highly paid quarter of the workforce is four times more likely to receive employer-provided paid family leave than the lowest quartile. Um, College-educated workers are twice as likely to have access to paid leave as workers without a high school degree. Um, there are racial disparities here as well. Can you talk a little bit, Renee, about the effect on children and children's development um, who are living in poverty, whose parents don't, and then whose parents do have paid leave? Well, because there are so, f there's so little data, because there are so few states. I mean, as you said, or maybe I've read that there's only California and Rhode Island and New Jersey. And we just, and when I say we, NTCP just completed a qualitative research study of uh, parents in New Jersey to understand sort of what the experiences of, other, of those parents who actually took advantage of paid family leave and those who didn't. And I think there are some lessons from that that we really need to look at because it's not just about passing the legislation, it's about what the parameters of the legislation are, uh, how much is truly covered, what the, uh, whether in fact access is truly there, how difficult it is to gain access to understand it. Uh, does that really help? Is it enough payment? Because it's only two thirds and it's, a, it's not a long period of time that you have paid family leave. All those questions, I think, as I mentioned, it's District of Columbia and 19 other states that are considering it, but we have to do more than just make sure we pass something. Because when we talk to those parents who actually took advantage of leave, uh, it's still an issue of uh, it wasn't enough time. I really needed this to bond with my child, but there wasn't enough time. The funds that, that, that I was receiving, and receiving sometimes after I came back to work, and had to borrow funds in order to make ends meet while I was on leave, uh, it wasn't, it wasn't, it just wasn't enough. So the bonding with the child, being able to continue to breastfeed. Uh, so going back to work early because the opportunities to truly bond and to nurture your child and to, to help them uh, be all that they can be is limited because of the inadequacy of the length and the inadequacy of the uh, funding that's available. Thank you, Renee. These are very important questions right now, literally as it is being debated exactly what the parameters of the New York uh, State uh, leave are. Tom, you were an advocate for uh, parental leave, by that I mean fathers taking leave in Norway, even before uh, the parental quota, the father's quota, the, the daddy law, I think it's called, the daddy quota. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell us a little bit about your experience as a major executive in the financial sector? We are blocks away from Wall Street here in New York, and I think if we took a poll of how many traders on the street uh, in here in Wall Street um, actually took uh, months of family leave, um, it would be a, a pretty small number. So please tell us a little bit about your experience. Well, um, my daughter was born in 1990. Um, I had uh, a two weeks paid leave uh, right after the birth. That's what we got. But for me, that wasn't enough. I wanted to spend more time together with her uh, during her first year. So um, I got into uh, discussions with uh, my manager in the bank. Um, he supported me, but we still, and together, had to fight the HR department. So, uh, but uh, after a while, they, they decided that uh, it was a good idea. So I got actually one month extra paid, uh, and then I got 100% paid for that month. Wait, just you? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean as opposed to the comp your company. Yeah, but and then what happened, Tom? I'm sorry. <laughs> but, but back then, it, 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 it wasn't uh, regulated by the law. So if you didn't push it yourself, you didn't get it. So, um, so, uh, 
In 1993, uh, our son was born. But then it has changed the law. Um, gave me three months with paid leave. So, uh, and for me that was so important to, to be able to take the responsibility as a father and, and also to make sure that my kids uh, got a very good start in life to um, be there when they grew up. And uh, of course, to, to, uh, to be present when they needed me, not when I had the spare time to, to play with them. So, and I also wanted to be, uh, or try to be a good role model for my children. And how um, now, many years into the policy, when just remarkable figures that Minister Holm gave that nine out of 10 parent, fathers who have the uh, right to take the quota are taking it, how has that changed life at the bank, for example, where you have your male colleagues uh, taking time to be with their children? How has that uh, affected uh, the gender balance and opportunity in your workforce? Well, it's, um, it's actually so natural, you know, so we, we don't talk about it because it's, it's uh, I mean, when you become, uh, when uh, you became a father now, it, it's, you will have that time because that time is something that, uh, well, if you don't use it during the first first year or first three years, or uh, when the child is uh, at that age, you lose a lot. You will not be able to bond with them. I mean, it's like uh, for me when I look at some of my colleagues in other fina financial institutions here in the U.S., I can see that. Um, they, even if they want to stay at home, and even if their company give them uh, the possibility to stay at home with a fine policy and, and so on, they don't dare to take it because it's, uh, that is the same as saying that uh, uh, you actually don't uh, want to succeed in this company. And I think that is so uh, narrow-minded by the management because, I mean, the, um, the human uh, capital in a company, that is actually uh, the only valid asset that you have. So if you take the human capital out, you have nothing. So it's, um, I think it's, um, also important because uh, but I think you need to have a kind of um, uh, change of mindset, both uh, by the employees but also by the employer. The employees must dare to, to uh, speak out and, and stand up for their rights. And the employers must be willing to, uh, to give them that opportunity. And I think uh, for me it, and for the managers that I have had during all my years uh, working for the bank, um, for them it has been an investment in the employees because they know if they invest uh, in the employees that way, they will get uh, loyalty, flexibility, and hardworking people. So, uh, I mean, it's only upside for both parties. Only upside. Only upside for both parties. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Tom. I will say that um, early research has found that in California, um, the uh, retention of particularly low-paid workers who were able to um, use the um, paid family leave disability um, insurance increased. Um, we think that's very important, that the idea of people who, um, from the business perspective, 
people who have to very much choose between being able to make rent uh, and take even just a sick day off. I mean, we are living in a country where there's no mandated paid sick days, not even a single one, and that is a fight across the country, particularly for low-paid workers. It has actually affected um, uh, retention at low-wage firms. Um, so now we're going to hear uh, a very personal story from Amber, who has become a paid leave advocate um, despite I think herself, and didn't set out to be. And I just want to hear your story of how you became an advocate um, and how other parents um, sort of responded to your story and made pushed you into this role. Um, well, first of all, uh, what the circumstance that led to me being um, deciding to take up this issue was that my son died on his first morning at daycare. Difficulties. Anyways, um, so I, unlike to tell further about more background of the story, unlike most people in America, I actually did have a paid maternity leave, um, a short maternity leave. And when I say short, by Norwegian standards, it would be considered short, but by American standards, it would be considered very long. And that was three months. Um, but uh, right, like from the time, well, right from the time that my son Carl was born, I felt uncomfortable with the idea of leaving him. I mean, obviously, when he was a newborn, it was my first experience being a mother. Um, but from the f moment, first weeks of his life, I started to really dread that looming date of knowing I would have to go back to work. So in general, being pretty good at creative problem solving, I was trying, my partner Lee and I were discussing all the time, like every week or every day, um, different options, like how we could make it work. and. Like most families in America, there was not really the option of having just one income, especially, I think, living in New York City. And so um, that, that, that was kind of compounded by the fact that I was the one that had the health insurance in our family. So um, my son was on my health insurance. So I found, like, in my short experience being a parent that very often it was felt like a juggling act, and you were trying to always juggle all your responsibilities um, in the best possible way for your child, but also being financially responsible and um, responsible for his care and all of that type of thing. So I had asked my employer um, a few times if I could have more time off without pay, um, maybe pay my own health insurance or something, because we could manage financially for a few months um, to just tide over until going back to work. But I was told that there was no way that that was possible and that the only option would be to quit. So of course I did weigh that option, but ultimately it didn't seem like the most responsible thing to do. And I had a job that at a children's publisher, book publisher, and so they were pretty family friendly. So it seems like a pretty bad thing to give up that job <laughs> and um, be in the position of being unemployed in a couple months and having to pay childcare and look for a job again. Um, so I was already quite, um, both my partner and I were quite worried about going back to work, but ultimately, um, we made the choice that we did because also most of the mothers I knew had had much less time than I had. And certainly I never envisioned that my son's safety would be at risk. I didn't think that was what the stakes were. Um, so I chose a daycare that was quite close to my work, just two blocks away. And um, I would still go see him and go breastfeed him during the day, like every few hours. But. Um, the first day I was back at work, we dropped him off at daycare, and I returned at noon to find the uh, daycare worker performing CPR. And no, they couldn't tell, the med medical examiner could not tell what the cause of death was. So almost, I mean, of course there's a lot of shock and trauma involved, but one of the first, I don't know, lucid thoughts maybe I had was a conversation that my partner Lee and I had where we were just like, we couldn't help but feel that the direct relation of this angst about going back to work, leaving our son and having him die. Of course, we don't know that if he had been with me, it would have been any different, but um, at least he would have been with me, which was where I wanted him to be, and I wouldn't have this question of whether it was because someone didn't notice something was going wrong or something like that. So what I did at that point, um, as you know, a couple months went by and I was able to think a little more clearly, I started to just 
research other women's stories, um, just to kind of get a sense of if I was alone in this feeling like this was wrong, that we'd had no opportunities or a lot had no options at that point in our son's life. And I started to, of course, read all the stories that you read online about women who had to go back to work after two weeks, um, still not recovered from surgeries. Um, there was like the story of a woman who had, um, her baby was on oxygen at four weeks old and the boss was understanding and would let her bring the baby in to be breastfed a few times a day by the mother-in-law. And I, I, as I read the stories, I started to actually feel a little bit guilty as, as in, like, who am I to complain? I had three months because so many women have suffered so much, and maybe the outcome wasn't as tragic. But still, I almost started to doubt myself and feel like I was the lucky one. And then I was like, no, my son died. It's, it's the worst possible scenario. So I, I started to think about the way that this, our culture kind of devalues um, our children or the caregiving of our infants uh, so much that even as parents ourselves, we sometimes start to feel bad or feel that we shouldn't speak up and ask for more time or question these things. So the next step was, how, what, what do I do about this? I mean, I have no experience as an activist. I don't have any organizations that I work with, had worked with. Um, but I had been taking a class at, that was talking about the progressive era, and I found it really inspiring because I noticed the parallel, the obvious parallels, where there, at that time, the, our society, the early 1900s, um, A, women couldn't vote, but um, corporations really sort of like were dictating government policy, and there was a lot of social problems. There was no welfare for children, there was uh, food safety issues. And what I found kind of heartening, being not very organized myself, was that at that time, there wasn't a, like a lot of organization, but a lot of women especially just acted. They just did what they could. Everyone just, whatever voice they had, they used it to push forward one of these issues that maybe happened to fall in their lap or that they noticed. And um, in the end, that power of people writing, talking about it, maybe they had panels <laughs> back then, ended up causing a lot of change to happen. So that was why I decided to write an article that eventually was published in the New York Times that basically talked about this experience and called for parental leave. Thank you so much, Amber. That is, um, I think many of us in this room, particularly if we're here in New York, remember reading Amber's story and hearing about it and being deeply heartbroken. And, and of course, so many parents lose their children. Um, in our country, but so few of them make that a public, that private pain into a public cause. So I really just want to applaud you for being an advocate for this issue and for parents everywhere. So thank you. So I really want to open this up to conversation and questions now, um, because I'm sure there's a lot that are it's on your hearts and minds at the moment. So um, yes, OK. So I think that there is going to be a mic coming. Yeah. So the first question is right here. And if you wouldn't mind just identifying yourself, keeping your question brief so that everyone um, can have uh, a chance who wants one, and then also making it a question, not a speech. <laughs> OK, I'll do my best. Uh, Amber, everyone in the audience, I think is grateful that you were able to use that very tragic experience to mobilize others. So thank you for that. I guess my question is about the connection between the US and the New York uh, high maternal and infant mortality rates and the racial disparities, which may in fact be somewhat connected to the low wage workers not even having a day off um, and low wage workers not having the time to breastfeed. That's why I would argue for at least six months. But um, the health imperative I would like you to talk about. Renee, do you want to take that first? Sure. And, and this issue of breastfeeding is, as I said, uh, no, we, we uh, completed the, uh, the qualitative research doing focus groups and interviews with parents in New Jersey who 
who were eligible for paid family leave and took it, and those who were eligible and did not. And for those who, in both categories, this issue of uh, the need to breastfeed and an adequate time to do that was at the top, was, was a real issue, that and the, and the bonding. And we know the importance of breastfeeding, but if, in fact, you have so little time uh, off and you have to go back to work and you're in working situations where you can't even pump and you certainly can't bring your child, then there's a tendency not to do it at all. And so it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a huge issue. And I think when we're talking about pushing forward paid family leave, we have to think about how much time is really an appropriate amount of time and really push for it, as opposed to what I, I, I am tending to hear people say is, well, we just want to get something. And getting something ju j is, is something, but it's not enough. And on that getting something question, one of the major um, fault lines often in the policy design as, as legislators in the United States, legislators are very solicitous of uh, at least the perceived interest of business and the idea that we don't want to burden small businesses. Right, so like with the National Family and Medical Leave Act, there's often a debate about whether or not there should be a size threshold for employers, as if the children of uh, parents who work at small employers are somehow more uh, resilient and able to not be taken yeah. care of by their parents than ones w uh, who work at large employers. And that often also has, um, and um, as well, the issue of how long an employee has to have worked there. Um, the part-time status, these are the details that really do make a difference in the lives, particularly of um, parents of color and low-paid um, workers, because oftentimes um, those with not long tenure who are younger, and of course at their prime childbearing age, um, are those who really need the benefit. They're working for smaller uh, companies and they are not able to get even the guaranteed family leave. And right now, what we are hearing here in New York is that in the Republican budget, they want to carve out uh, smaller employers. So that is definitely going to be a fight. Um, yes, over here. Thank you. Um, I think that last point was really um, pertinent, particularly to me. I had the benefit of being someone who worked in the state of New Jersey and moved to Germany six months before I gave birth. And so I had the benefit of having New Jersey's very generous maternity leave policy and also being the beneficiary of one year paid medical leave in Germany. However, what I experienced was that while my company I realized at three months, I thought I was ready to go back after six weeks as a very career-focused woman. I wasn't ready to go back after six weeks. I wasn't ready to go back to after three months. And quite frankly, I really needed that one year and I breastfed until 17 months. Um, at that point, having conversations with people in Germany, and particularly women, is that with the th one year paid, three-year guaranteed job back, it actually had a negative effect on career-focused women in the workforce. So where do we strike that balance between how do you offer women and men for maternity and paternity leave the opportunity to create that opportunity for bonding, for appropriate breastfeeding, but also make it um, economically feasible, not only for small businesses, but mid-sized businesses. And in my case, I was working for a Fortune 500 company. How do you make that business case for getting them back in the workforce, creating that um, that bridge for a one year or longer maternity leave and making it beneficial to everyone. Because I think that's a really, really difficult balance to strike. Maybe in Norway, they've mastered that. Um, <laughs> certainly in Germany, that's not the case, where there is significant gender disparity f because of the, the very generous maternity leave policies. And I, I'm not familiar, is, does, does the German law have a quota for 
fathers as well Uh, i'm sure it's not a year or three years actually it's one or the other so the father can take the leave or the mother can take the leave only one of them gets paid for the first year but there is that you are not guaranteed your specific job when you come back but you're guaranteed a place within the company when you return and oftentimes what i've heard is that if you don't come back within that 12 month period you are offered a job but it may not be at the same level or qualification or or the specific job set that you that you left with. Tom, do you want to talk about this? Uh, I think no matter what kind of um, of solution you end up with, that is a challenge that you will face. Um, how to deal with it? I know that um, the. Uh, very much of the debate in uh, Norway these days are uh, regarding um, equal rights and uh, equal opportunities for a career for the women. Um, so, of course, I think we must be that honest to say that we face this kind of, of uh, situations or problems or challenges in Norway as well. But uh, I don't think it's any quick fix on uh, on how to to get the best solution for both the uh, the uh, uh, corporates and the employees and and to get women back on the track in the career. It's I think that's. That's a difficult question. <laughs> so, do you want to? I saw you whispering over there. Do you want to play in here? <laughs> I'm not sure if I can answer the question, but we have um, a law in Norway. They say that you are, uh, you should have the same job after you're coming back from the parental leave. Um, so it's not possible for the employees to, to give the job that you had before to another. So that's a guarantee. And that, I think that's also one of the strong discrimination legislation that we have in Norway, that it's illegal to discriminate women or men uh, because of the pregnancy or also uh, 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 the breastfeeding. Uh, in, you have uh, allowed to do that also. But it's a good question, so because we need that um, women can um, make career too, and I think that um, that father is participating in the uh, are taking the, the quota, and that we they can also, uh, if fathers should take the quota in Norway, the mother has to go back to the be in activities in the work. So that's also some of the Scandinavian, uh, what do you say? Um, uh, use the way to also to solve that women need to go back to the, the, the in the workforce. They cannot take the the, the weeks together uh, uh, all the time. Okay. Other questions? Yes, back there and then in the front. Great panel. Hello. Um, in the United States, uh, we often talk about other countries, but we're also a nation that doesn't like to look at the rest of the world. You know, we have this exceptionalism. So I guess my question is, how do we make the case to policymakers? Um, I think in our, we also have a very different ethos in the United States. I think it has to be an economic case. So that's my first question is how do, do Americans make this case? Um, and two is, I'd like to know more about the um, some of the um, mechanics of it, the take-up rate based on um, the replace the cap on replacement of salary, because I know that data shows that men, even in European countries, are not taking up uh, paid leave opportunities um, if they're not in line with what they need to make. And this, of course, um, you know, for their families. And this, of course, affects gender inequality. Um, so I will say that um, requiring employers to offer paid leave is actually enormously popular in the United States among voters. 
even though it is not apparently very popular among our legislators. Um, it is um, overwhelmingly popular among Republican voters. Um, the Family Act, which is the federal paid family leave law, um, gets, I think, three out of, no, uh, five out of 10, so 55% of Republican women support it. Um, it is one of those issues where there is just a massive gulf, not between left and right, but between um, sort of inside the halls of power and outside the halls of power. Um, I do think the fact that California and New Jersey, uh, a Demos fellow named Sharon Lerner did a great report about the business experience in New Jersey of uh, paid leave. Um, there are great reports about the California experience. Employers overwhelmingly find no administrative burden or paperwork or employee disincentive, and there are even those um, benefits to very high turnover um, workers and industries as well. So there is a business case to be made. There is a bipartisan case to be made. Um, you know, we know that because of our inequalities of voice in our democracy, whether it's campaign finance, lobbying, or the structural gaps in who is registered to vote, that um, unfortunately organized business just has a much louder uh, voice in policymaking than uh, working in middle class families. That's where we are today, both at the state level and at the federal level. So I think you're seeing that more than the idea that there's not an empirical business case or that it's actually so polarized among uh, voters. Um, I do want to answer, have someone answer your question about the replacement rate. Um, I'm going to just say what I think I know is that in Norway it's 80 or 100% of pay, and that obviously is a massive incentive to actually using the program. Um, I said I promised someone over here. Yes, go ahead. Hi. For a little bit of background, I um, run an agency that fills parental leaves via a network of freelancers. And so I'm working with a lot of the trailblazers who already have parental leave policies or announced them last year, because 18 companies last year announced new paid parental leave policies. But what I'm finding out, which is interesting, because I see the light at the end of the tunnel that this is gonna happen. Um, but what's interesting is they have these policies, but they don't have any systems in place to support them, um, which in particular affects their coworkers, um, and then also when they come back from work. So I'm curious what the panel has to say about, okay, when we get paid parental leave, what else do we need to support it to make it something that everyone supports, whether they have children or not? Um, so, yeah. Thank you, very exciting. Well, <laughs> I think, um, Back to what I said about uh, changing the mindset. Um, as a guest in the US, I should be uh, very careful about uh, uh, giving critics to, <laughs> to the country. OK. That, <laughs> but it's, it's a little bit about um, not always thinking about me and I. But thinking about we and That's us. That's too far. <laughs> <laughs> no. But it, it's, and I mean, if you look at it, uh, most of us get children when we are in the 30s. Uh, then we still have like 30, 35 years in, in the work uh, lifetime again. So, um, for me personally, I don't understand why not people can can uh, put the career on hold for a year or two when you still have more than 30 years to make that career and make it happen. Because if if it uh, it's a meaning that you should have a career, you will have it. So it's but uh, you have to contribute with something. You have to give something. So, so uh, um, but of course, for many people, it will be hard to, to accept to take that uh, step back. 
But if you don't take it, uh, well, you won't won't get any further with uh, with this question. So it's uh, and it's a little bit also. I mean, if you decide to have a child, why do you want to outsource it after a couple of weeks? I mean, then you're the child. Why should the child have any bonds to you? You're just another stranger like any other people. So it's, uh, <laughs> I don't see the logic. Well. Yes, let's leap in on that one. OK, all right. So, <laughs> all right, Amber and internet. I was also thinking about what Tom said, how it, now no one even talks about paternity leave because it's just a norm. And it's kind of like, I mean, we have vacation days at work, and nobody thinks about that with a lot of angst. I think that eventually what happens, it just becomes part of the culture and people adapt. That's what humans do. And um, businesses form, such as the business she mentioned, where people fill the niches and the needs that arise as a result of parental leave. But I think that there's plenty of examples, like the whole world has parental leave and it works. <laughs> so we might be really worried about the details, but we have a lot of people we can ask <laughs> how, how to manage all of that. <laughs> All right, Renee, you want to jump in? So, yeah, so I, I feel like I'm, I could be able to sleep tonight because all I'm thinking about is Norway and what kind of programs they have there. And we're so far from it, we're so far from it that the question becomes what is it that, that we can achieve that's achievable? And I'm not one to say, oh, you know, let's do the best we can, but, but what's reasonable and what's achievable and what can we can we, we show the public really is going to make a difference. And, and in terms of, and again, I have to speak from the perspective of a low income parents who also want to have families, but you can't make the decision that I'm going to take the time off because at least as the program exists in New Jersey, first of all, you get very little time, and secondly, you only get two thirds of your pay. And that's part of the reason that the majority of parents who take it in New Jersey are women because they have to take it. I mean, they want to, but I mean, you, you have to. You have to take at least some of it because you're going to have the child. Uh, for men, at least the few that we've had in our focus groups, they can't afford to do that. You know, they would only make two thirds of their salary. They feel, they feel like uh, the mother should take it. If anyone's gonna take it, she should. But neither one of them can afford to take some long period of time. And, and unfortunately, because of the lack of sort of promoting its availability, the Many of those who took it, it was quite a struggle to even learn about it and learn there was access to it. And for many of them that we did focus groups with who didn't take it, the first time they ever heard of it was in the focus group. So we ended up having to, because we realized then we were off topic because they were asking questions about the program and could you look at my, because they were saying, oh, well, it's nice if the employer gives it to you. It's not even something the employer gives you. You're paying for it. So I think that there are all kinds of issues about the way in which it's presented, the way in which people understand it that enables them to even take it and take advantage of it. So that's one thing. And the other piece of it is, based on the number of states that are considering it, what can we learn that can make it better for those that are, are trying to move forward? So Anne-Marie wants to weigh in. I just wanted to say one word, two things about how we can normalize it, and I'll, I'll stand this way, uh, it, it, that, that I think are particularly helpful. One is that all managers are required to have extended coverage plans. So at least in many corporations, if you're a manager, part of being a good manager is having a succession plan. The argument is, you know, if you get hit by a bus tomorrow, who's going to take over? And if you haven't done that, then you're not doing your job. And extended coverage is the same idea, that if anybody in your workforce, something happens, and obviously it could be a child, it could be an accident, it could be anything, you need to figure out with your team how that's gonna be covered. So that's one. And the other is, again, this is not just children, right? I always say you can choose, or not, but 
you be, can better choose whether or not to have children. You can't choose whether or not to have parents. Uh, and so you just emphasize, okay, oh, you know, you may be yeah. picking up more now, but someday uh, you, you are likely to have, have that responsibility. All right, so is that, you're saying five minutes? Oh, no. no, I was actually have You want a question? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, hi. Um, so I just wanted to come back, actually, to the the, the question that the, the the lady here in the second row made. I, I'm when I was uh, preparing for this event, I, I read a great deal of data on maternal and child mortality, uh, and uh, at how it's dropped. Actually, I, I read Norwegian studies because we're we're working in Norway, but but it's um, our child our infant mortality rate is is three times higher. Um, than it is in Norway. Um, our maternal mortality rate, um, we're the only country in the OECD where it's actually on the rise. Um, and parental leave, paid leave, has been found to have really dramatic effects on just, you know, these very basic things. And, and so I wanted to sort of note that, but also um, to ask maybe Renee, if you could just sort of expand a little bit on uh, the sort of the impact that the lack of paid leave has on like lower income families and on the decisions they have to make about childcare, their ability to bond with children, parental stress that actually, and, and the effects that that has on the, the health of their children. I, I know you've done work that showed, you know, that, that um, you know, that, that workers who don't have paid leave are less likely to take their children to the doctor, they're less likely to go to themselves. The, um, but on, on the effect that that has uh, throughout childhood and, and adolescence, that, 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 those, um, that, that those upheavals can have, um, and the way that perpetuates um, you know, some of the inequalities that we see in this country. Well, I can't really make the association between paid family leave or not in some of these health and development issues because, as I said, we don't have, I mean, there are so few places that have paid leave in the, in the U.S. and the programs are different than those three states that do and we're just not collecting the kind of data that would enable us to say something in any definitive way about it. But I will say this, that when we do the kind of qualitative research that we did in New Jersey, to get at more than the numbers and sort of understand the kinds of issues and uh, and difficult decisions and that that uh, poor families have to make when they what's available to them just isn't enough are the kinds of things that we can then learn enough about to try to do the kind of research on that would enable us to say some things that have strong associations. I just can't, based on what we know now say I can point to research that would tell you that. Now, I could point to research around issues of maternal depression and the high rate of maternal depression among poor women as opposed to the general population. I mean, rates of maternal depression are as high as 50 to 60 percent in samples of poor families with children. And we know there's a connection between uh, maternal depression uh, immediately after pregnancy and some of the issues that uh, we're hearing from women who didn't have paid family leave, couldn't stay away long, those that did but still couldn't stay away long. And we can make some kind of uh, sort of guesses about what that means, but we can't make clear associations. Are, are there organizations um, here in the U.S. that are that are looking at comparative data from countries that have enacted paid leave policies? I, I, the Norwegian studies were, you know, longitudinal studies looking at families uh, before and after paid leave, and they and they actually found that um, looking at the same populations, controlling for everything, that um, children after paid leave was enacted, they you know. Fewer behavioral problems in school, lower rates of teenage pregnancy. I mean, do, do these things surprise you that it can have no, such far-reaching effects? No, or? not at all. But yeah. in terms of what we're looking at and what the research is telling us about the U.S. Mm -hmm. and the parallels with with other countries, yeah. those countries are so different that we can't make those kinds of 
comparisons. We can just say what's happening in those countries and how much better it is there. But when I hear what those programs are, I come back to that same question of what's going to be possible here? Let's be realistic about we want a good, a good outcome, but what is it that we need to push for that we truly believe is going to happen? Amber, you want to weigh in? I was just thinking on along the lines of Catherine's question is just that I think this is why we come together and why we have Norway. We can learn children are the same in Norway as they are in America. And I think that it's true we don't have like the exact same ability to study since we don't have that kind of benefit. But we can certainly see from those Norwegian studies that it does have a real effect on um, outcomes for children um, when the longer the, the paid leave goes on. So I think that's something that maybe we can use is the fact that we know it doesn't matter what country children are from, their development is still affected in the same way by having their mm -hmm. primary parent with them. I do want, we're, we're winding down in terms of time. If there's anyone in the audience who wants to give a little advertisement for what people in the room can do to help advance yep. paid family leave in New York. Yes. That will be helpful. Right <laughs> That'd be great. Hi, I'm Nancy Rankin. I'm director of research at Community Service Society and on the steering committee of the New York State Paid Family Leave uh, Campaign. And so I actually had a question, and it's a question for all of you, the entire audience, and that question is, what are you going to do tomorrow? Because paid family leave, whether you get it or not as a New Yorker, is going to be determined by our state legislature in the next three weeks, by the end of March. Now, the governor has put forward a proposal um, that would cover all workers, all size businesses. It's 12 weeks. It has job security. And notice that New Jersey and California, their paid family leave don't have job security. It has two-thirds wage replacement. And it includes not just parental leave, but family leave to care for a seriously ill family member with a broad, inclusive definition of family. So what is critical is that our legislators and the governor's office need to hear from all of us, particularly the leadership of the Senate, uh, the Republican leadership, because everyone, uh, everyone has now agreed that New York should have paid family leave. There are proposals in both the Assembly and the Senate and in the governor's executive budget, but the question is the details. And every one of those is at risk from the um, Republican Senate. So, is what, there a website that folks can yes, go to? Yes, you can if go. You haven't to, contacted your legislator. Mm -hmm. Don't know what to say. Mm -hmm. You can um, do it by contacting. Uh, you can look at our website at um, cssny.org and the paid leave part. Um, you can. Uh, AARP also has a call through number that'll patch you in to your uh, senator. You can talk to me afterwards. But the next two or three weeks are absolutely critical. And I want to give a shout out to Nancy and the Community Service Society because her organization, as well as the Center for Women at Work at Rutgers University, New Jersey Citizen Action, Statewide Parent Advocacy Network, and Advocates for Children of New Jersey were all partners in this project that we did to try to learn how to improve the program in New Jersey. All right, so unfortunately, we're running low on time. So I'd love to just hear uh, final few sentences from each of our panelists, and then they will be here over wine, I know. Um, <laughs> fortunately, I think Amber can't partake, which is very, very exciting. Um, OK, so uh, Renee, do you want to start? Just closing thoughts for us. Yeah, so closing thoughts. You know, I have this binder up here because I wanted to be able to uh, share some words from some of the participants in the program who talked about the importance of the uh, of the program to them. So I, I, I will try to 
find the positive because a lot of what I found here was about what, how the, the program could be improved, how they can learn about access, what will be better. But the, all in terms of the group who were part of the uh, program were saying that it made such a difference to them. It enabled me to bond with my child. It gave me the time I needed, not all the time I needed, but it, uh, enough time that I really felt that there were some important connections I made to my child. Uh, that my husband continued to work, uh, and it would have been nice if he had an opportunity to, uh, to spend some time with, my, uh, with our child as well. So those who took it said it made a world of difference to them. They just wished it would be a longer program and a, uh, with, more, uh, with a higher percentage of coverage of their, uh, their, their income when they're off. Thank you so much, Renee. Thank you mm -hmm. for the work that you do. Tom, parting words? Uh, just want to give an advice to all the men that uh, are planning to be a father. Um, when I was born, uh, my parents were very young. My mother was 17, my father was 19. They uh, didn't have much money, so, but they rented a small apartment, actually only one room. Uh, my bed was next to the record player, and my father was a huge Frank Sinatra fan. So I grew up with Frank Sinatra. So uh, he was one of my closest friends. And he has actually given in one of his songs, um, it's called uh, Soliloquy. There he give the script on how to become a great dad, how you should bond with your uh, kid, and uh, how you should love and care for your child. It uh, was first recorded in 1963. It's eight minutes long, but it's well worth of both. Uh, watch it up on YouTube. There you can see old blue eyes when he uh, delivered the speech. But that is one of my favorite songs, and it has meant so much to me uh, when I got my kids. Thank you, Tom. Wonderful. <laughs> All right, Amber. Um, I guess I would just like to say that um, I think that it can be very discouraging in the current political climate to feel like um, this is such a left-right issue. And um, uh, I try and always think of it this way, that in the entire world, except for uh, here and in Papua New Guinea, there's all different kinds of political systems and philosophies and ideologies. but. In all of these different countries, people can agree that this issue is, it transcends politics, that our children are important enough, and this is important enough that we give them this time with their parents. Um, so I think that the key is for us as individuals not to just sort of give up, but there are ways, uh, as um, the lady mentioned, to lobby our government. We can't just give up because the businesses have so much power. We have a lot of power too. Um, if anyone wants to make it easy to lo lobby their um, representatives at the, at the um, federal level, uh, we have a website that we made called forcarl.com, and you can go there and put in your zip code and easily send an email, a tweet, or call your representative and just tell them your support. And it doesn't have to be parental leave. You can, say, you can put in whatever it is that you want to support, but just don't forget to contact your representatives because that's what we can do. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, please join me in thanking the panel and thanking New America and Norway for putting on this event.